The fire started here on Pudding Lane in the early hours of the morning on Sunday, September the 2nd, 1666. It seems to have started in one of the fires of a baker's shop held by Thomas Farriner, whose name is recorded on a plaque here. It went on burning through Sunday, Monday and Tuesday and into Wednesday the 5th of September when it eventually died down. During that time it consumed around 16,000 houses and about 87 parish churches and many other of the main buildings of, of the City of London. The fire consumed about one-sixth of the area. We're standing in front of London's monument built in 1671 to commemorate the Great Fire of London. This wasn't London's first fire. London had had many, many fires. But let's think about what the city itself was like. First of all, it's really crowded. The streets are very, very narrow. The buildings are quite tall and it's full of people. It's very densely populated. So not only does everybody's house have a fireplace, but you have smiths, braziers, cookshops, all of open fires. So there's lots of opportunities for things to catch fire. And it's a really noisy city, much like it is now because there's so much work going on within the walls of the city of London. You can hear smiths beating on metal. You can hear horses' hooves. Incredibly loud noises like that. It's probably difficult to hear yourself think at times. One of the interesting things about the fire is how little evidence we have about how it affected ordinary people. But the fact is we have no idea how many people died. And the poorer you are, the less likely your deaths are to be recorded. The immediate effect of the fire on the city of London was that people left. They eventually would end up camping in places like Spitalfields or Moorfields, those fields just outside the, the city, and then they'd go even further to Highgate or Highbury, up the hill. There's no fire insurance, um, there's no, if you didn't take your belongings you had lost everything, so it had a huge impact on people's livelihoods. And of course the other impact was on the possibility of rebuilding. What was going to happen to these houses that had been burnt literally right down to the ground? If you look at any of the famous pictures we have of London before the fire, the first thing you see is the church spires. Because we're so used to St Paul's, such an iconic building, we don't tend to think that there was something there beforehand. One way of thinking about this is this is the end of a great cathedral rather than the beginning of one. Old St Paul's was the longest cathedral in England. It was, had a height of about 500 foot by the time you put the tower and the spire together. It was one of the great measuring landmarks of London. If you look at representations of early modern London, you see this forest of church spires with this huge cathedral spire sticking up in the middle as the focus of it. And that's all lost at the Great Fire because it destroys the cathedral. It's because people see it as a stone structure. When the Great Fire breaks out, many of the people who work in the area around the cathedral think it's the safest place to put combustible materials. So all the booksellers bring their books and other cloth materials into the crypt, St Paul's Cathedral for safekeeping. They try and block up all the holes where sparks might get in. And for two days after the Great Fire starts, this is okay. And then on the 4th of September, a spark lands on an unprotected bit of the roof and it takes hold. And then once the fire gets into all this stuff inside the cathedral, it causes uh, a major conflagration within. So, so Christopher Wren, who we now associate with uh, the new St Paul's, is put in charge of survey of the fabric in 1669, and the actual rebuild project isn't finished until 1710. So this is one of the largest construction projects of the 17th century. The recovery of the city is interesting because in some ways, not many things changed based on the medieval street pattern. London had been growing organically since the Roman period and it continued to do so. It was simply impossible to, to, to change the boundaries. So what ended up happening was that new styles of houses were built on the old street patterns. One of the interesting and less predictable results of the fire is that it opened up opportunities in the city. When the Corporation of London needed to encourage new businesses to come back to the city after the fire in the period of rebuilding, it lifted some of the guild regulations that had insisted that only freedmen could, could run shops in the city. And so it didn't just encourage in men from outside the city, but it also allowed women to take up businesses and to run their own shops, often seamstresses shops within the city. So we see a slight increase in the numbers of women running independent businesses.